and uh, thanks for the kind invitation to, uh, for me to participate in this meeting uh, i welcome you all but i would just like to start from uh, this slide uh, for those of you who don't know him he was uh, my teacher my mentor and uh, everything that i'm going to talk about today and maybe much more that i will not be able to talk today uh, was taught by this man he is uh, he was professor anton valvanis chief of neuroradiology in zurich i spent two years with him and then subsequently many many years of visiting him in, in between so whatever i'm trying to show to you today is uh, a condensation of what i have learned from him whenever we are confronted with an avm with a brain avm our aim is to start from here the aim is to start from a complex network of vessels which are being fed by the arteries of the brain which are also supplying normal brain parenchyma this ultimately drains into tiny collector veins and ultimately those collector veins join to form what is called as a nidal draining vein and this ultimately drains into one of the venous sinuses of the brain so whenever we treat these complex lesions our aim is to basically start from here and reach a situation in which the avm is gone completely uh, along with its draining vein because we know that the draining vein is the seat of the disease of the avm and we also have to make sure that all the arterial territories that were supplying the avm because in our mind we have to know that this is not just supplying the avm this is supplying the surrounding brain as well so you have to make sure at the end of embolization that the supplying vessels are left completely intact otherwise you will have an avm which is occluded but you will also have a patient who is left with a deficit so when we embark on this journey of curing an avm uh, of a curative endovascular treatment of an avm uh, we can basically break down the entire process into three parts the first and the foremost part is obviously the avm nidus the avm nidus is the structure that is the target for our treatment and this is the structure that needs to be completely obliterated during the treatment you do not have any control over the avm nidus the avm nidus will not be as per what you want it to be the avm nidus is a part of the disease process and the avm nidus will have its own idiosyncrasies so that is something that you cannot change the second part of the whole story is the catheterization techniques this is where the entire discussion that you have been having since today morning about the hardware and about uh, the distal access systems and the liquid embolics comes into play because the catheterization techniques are completely under your control now these catheterization techniques over the last couple of decades have improved obviously in direct proportion to the improvement in the technology of the catheters that have been made available to us for example the first generation microcatheters were so stiff that they could not go beyond a certain point for example they could go maybe up to m3 but now we have devices and catheters which can go right into the avm nidus in fact not just into the nidus but into each of the catheter each of the tiny sulco commissural vessels of the avm nidus so this is the first part that we are going to talk about the second part that we are going to talk about that we can control is the choice of embolic material and the way in which it flows from the catheter into the avm nidus because you have been hearing a lot about liquid embolics about their characteristics about their properties about them precipitating polymerizing adhesive non adhesive etc so all these properties are also very useful in different situations when we are trying to deposit a particular amount of liquid embolic inside an avm in a very predefined area so when we talk about curative embolization of avms essentially it comes down to the catheterization techniques the catheterization techniques boil down to the quality of the hardware that is available to you once the catheterization has been achieved you again have to deposit the embolic material inside the avm so that the avm is completely excluded from the circulation 
and that is dependent on the kind of embolic material that you choose along with the various properties of that embolic material as we will see in the subsequent slides. As I mentioned, the AVM will have a feeding artery. The feeding artery can be straight or the feeding artery can be very, very tortuous like this. So this is a situation which will make me decide what kind of hardware I want to use to reach this particular level. And then the AVM will have its nidus and then ultimately it will have a nidal vein. From the studies of uh, 1950s and 1960s, now we know that the AVM is purely or predominantly a venous structure. 90% of the AVM nidus is made up of venous endothelial material. 10% of the AVM is made up of the feeding arteries which come from the periphery, arborize on the AVM and then supply the arteriovenous shunts. So what you have to understand is, this is the area, this is the peripheral area that is going to be available to you for accessing the AVM when you are doing a transarterial embolization. This is the structure on the top, that is the draining vein, is going to be available to you when you are trying to do a transvenous embolization. A transvenous embolization is not something that should be attempted at the initial levels. So we will confine our discussion to the transarterial embolization of brain AVMs. We will also be discussing about how to choose hardware which are going to go into these tiny vessels and then we will follow it up with examples. Once the entire embolization is completed, we also use technology which according to me again is a part of the hardware that you need to discuss. We use technology to create a cast, uh, an image of the cast and then we try to see whether the image of the cast is a mirror example of the AVM or not so that we know where all we have embolized, have we taken the draining vein or not and have we knocked off any of these feeding arteries which is not our interest. Just touching upon what kind of AVMs we see in the brain. Uh, in the brain, we will see AVMs with mainly these three different situations in which the arterial tree has to be catheterized. The simplest will be a situation in which a distal leptomeningeal artery will go and end directly in the AVM. Now, this is a situation which is most amenable to catheterization. There is not too much of tortuosity here and you know that the catheter is going to end directly in the AVM. In other words, this particular situation, in this disposition, if you park your catheter somewhere at this point, we will see later how to do it. If you park your catheter somewhere at this point and from here you start injecting your liquid embolic material, most likely, the liquid embolic material will enter, will fill the entire nidus of the AVM and then will start percolating into the vein. So this is the simplest predisposition of an AVM that you can get. However, this is not the most common. This you see only in maybe around 30% of cases. In most AVMs, what you are going to see is, you are going to see a tortuous artery which is going in the vicinity of the AVM you will also realize that this artery does not stop in the AVM, but this artery continues its way forward through the AVM nidus and goes and supplies surrounding brain parenchyma even distal to the AVM. But as it reaches the AVM, it gives multiple transcortical small branches. These, you can see these arteries, these are thin arteries. These arteries are around 50 to 100 microns in diameter. And these are the vessels which will be coming and which will be supplying the AVM. So you can automatically realize the difference and the difficulty in the catheterization of this AVM when compared to the previous situation in which the artery was ending directly into the nidus. In this situation, you have to enter into the main feeding leptomeningeal artery. And then from the main feeding leptomeningeal artery, you have to come down into each of these tiny vessels and then you have to inject your embolic material from these tiny vessels. We will be showing you examples of these as well. So the first kind of disposition is seen in the so-called sulcal AVMs. 
the most common type of AVM is the so-called gyral AVM, which is inside the gyrus, which is covered by a rim of gray matter. And this is the kind of disposition that you get. Unfortunately, this happens to be the commonest disposition that we encounter. And you have a third set of vessels, which is shown over here. These are the vessels which are in the vicinity of the AVM, but they are going across the AVM without supplying the AVM at all. So this is the so-called perinidal vessel, and this is the so-called perinidal angiogenesis. So whenever you are treating an AVM, uh, your aim has to be catheterization of this vessel if present. Your catheterization has to be of this vessel if present, but you have to identify these perinidal vessels and leave them alone. How do you identify them? Uh, very simple, they will not participate in the arteriovenous shunt. So if you put your microcatheter in this particular artery and you start injecting, you will find that there is no early venous phase from this area. That is when you realize that this is an artery that you need not treat in the particular setting. So this is the so-called perinidal vessels. Uh, I will just skip this. Or okay, uh, let, let me show this to you. I'm sorry. The examples uh, I just now discussed about the most uh, easy predisposition for embolizing AVMs and the difficult predisposition for embolizing AVMs. If you want to see examples, this is a situation in which this is a microcatheter. This microcatheter has gone through the leptomeningeal circulation and this microcatheter is ultimately ending in a vessel which is somewhere here at this point and from here onwards all you can see is the AVM. So this is basically the so-called sulcal AVM and the catheterization of this particular AVM is not a very challenging catheterization. But if you compare this with the next example, uh, just to make it easy for you, I will just twist this uh, picture. You can see that this is a microcatheter which has gone through the middle cerebral artery. That is through the M1, that is in the M1. Uh, then you are going across into the insula, that is the inferior lip of the circular sulcus. You reach the circular sulcus and then when you ascend from the circular sulcus, this is the inferior frontal gyrus. So now you can see that you have an artery which is going over the inferior frontal gyrus, which is going distally and continuing into the inferior frontal sulcus and then into the middle frontal gyrus, which is going ahead. But on the way, by multiple transcortical uh, medullary arteries, it is feeding this AVM. So in this case, the point at which the microcatheter is, this is not at all safe for you to start embolizing from here. We will have to take this catheter a bit more further and we will have to try and negotiate it into one of these very tiny vessels. And then once we are wedged into one of these very tiny vessels, then we will start the embolization. So if you compare this with the previous one, you can see that the embolization can start right from here it can start right from here. But if you come to the other one, as of now, you are not in a good position. You have to ascend. You have to enter these vessels. Therefore, the kind of AVM that you are going to treat, that you are going to encounter, will decide upon the kind of hardware that you are going to choose. In a so-called sulcal AVM, in this situation, any microcatheter or any flow-guided mi microcatheter will do the job you will be able to reach this area because there is not much of tortuosity. And even a double-tipped microcatheter, a coiling microcatheter in certain situations can reach this situation. Whereas, if you look at a gyral AVM in which you do have to take multiple loops, but at the same time, you have to take this so-called cortical bend. You are in the artery and then from there you have to take a 90 degree bend. So these are situations in which you want the most supple and the tiniest diameter microcatheters, which are only flow-guided microcatheter. For example, in this we went ahead with a Magic 1.2 because even a Magic 1.5 or a Marathon was too large to enter one of these vessels. So automatically, what I'm trying to tell you is when you are encountering an AVM, 
when you do the diagnostic study itself, even before the microcatheter exploration, you will have an idea so as to which kind of AVM it is. And therefore, your choice of hardware will depend on the kind of AVM that you're going to treat. Another interesting thing that we have noted when we uh, reviewed our material is now we have crossed the stage of catheterization. We have reached a particular position with the catheter of our choice. Now is the time to select the embolic material. So what kind of embolic material would I select for a particular AVM? We have found that the rarest type of our AVMs 9%, maybe 1 in 10, are the so-called fistulous AVMs, in which you have an artery which is communicating directly with a vein, more often seen in the younger age group in the pediatric population. Almost 90% of our cases are in the pediatric population. This is almost like a single whole fistula. This is a situation in which the artery is communicating directly with the vein. This is a situation in which, because of the large AV shunt, the feeding artery is also very large. The size of the artery is huge. The feeding vein is also very large. If you put an embolic material in this AV shunt, there is a very high likelihood that your embolic material is just going to fly off into the venous system. So you will try to use a catheter which is slightly larger in diameter, which is slightly bulkier, so that it can occlude as much of the lumen of this feeding artery as possible. At the same time, you have to also take into account how distal it is, because if it is very distal, your double-tipped large bore microcatheters will not go to that distance. So depending on how far in the circulation this fistula is located, uh, you would like to choose a large bore catheter. And when it comes to the embolic material, you would like to choose a material which is adhesive, like NBCA, like glue. You will not like to choose a material which is uh, a precipitant, like for example the DMSO-based agents, because they will not get any time to opacify and solidify in this region. They will just get washed off. So this is one situation. The second situation is what we see in around one third of our cases, a situation in which you have a feeding artery. This feeding artery can either directly supply the AVM or it can go transcortical as I showed you. But once it goes transcortical or once it goes directly, it forms a plexiform network. That is a network of vessels. And this network of vessels ultimately anastomoses with the venous system and then you have a draining vein. So this is a situation in which the flow is not very high. The flow is relatively slower, much slower when compared to the situation on top. And you do have access almost up to the nidus. So this is a situation in which you would like to take a flow guided microcatheter, which will take you up to the nidus. And once you enter the nidus, you have a choice of materials because the flow is not very fast. Here, if you inject gently, even your DMSO-based agents or even your uh, Lipiodol-based glue, either of the agents will work very well. Unfortunately, these two situations are not the common ones. The commonest that we see is a situation, 56% of our cases, in which there is a subtype or a subcompartment of the nidus which is fistulous and there is a subcompartment of the nidus which is plexiform. So these are the biggest problems because these represent the commonest type of predispositions that we get. Now, both of these, let us say, we can catheterize this with a flow guided microcatheter, we can catheterize this with a flow guided microcatheter you can automatically start realizing that the amount, of, the amount of shunting that is occurring in this zone is much higher and much faster than the amount of shunting that is happening in this zone. So if you were to use liquid embolics of the same density, of the same properties in both these compartments, that is when you are going to have a problem. 
If you are somehow able to catheterize this vessel, you will see that the liquid embolic is behaving in a very, very nice way. It is going where you want it. It is traveling where you want it. And uh, it is getting deposited, opacified, solidified where you want it. But the moment you pull your catheter or the moment you catheterize this compartment of the AVM, you will realize that the same embolic material which behaved very well in the previous injection is not behaving well at all in this injection because it is just flying off. So you have to anticipate these challenges before you do the embolization so that you choose your hardware, your catheter appropriately and your embolic material appropriately. What I'll try to do is I'll try to show you an example of each of these three in the video session and then maybe you can understand from there what I'm talking about. When you have catheterized the vessel, when you have catheterized the vessel in the periphery of the AVM and you are entering into the nidus, once you enter into the nidus and you do super selective angioarchitectural assessment of the nidus, you will find that even the nidus, which is predominantly a venous structure, is made up of various types of vessels. For example, in the periphery of the AVM, this is the peripheral part of the AVM, this is the intermediate part of the AVM, and this is the central part of the AVM. For all practical purposes, the peripheral part of the AVM is the part which interacts with the normal brain and which derives its blood supply from the normal brain. For example, you can have this blood supply coming in from the leptomeningeal system or you can have this blood supply coming in from the deep perforator system or the striate system. The challenge of catheterization of each of these again is going to be very, very different. But what you have to realize is once the vessels reach the periphery of the AVM, they arborize, they arborize into these tiny twigs, into these tiny twigs, and then they immediately make anastomosis with the venous structures. Now the venous structures can be in the form of these spirally called vessels, they can be in the form of these loose tubular vessels, or they can be in the form of these vermiform vessels. What you also have to realize is, each of these vessels has got a different level of fragility. The peripheral vessels are more arterial and they have the least fragility, but as you come to the in intermediate zones, this is where the fragility of the vessels is very high. The maximum fragility occurs when you have intercompartmental connections and when you have these intercompartmental channels. These are the weakest. Why I'm showing you this is when you are injecting in an AVM, for example, you are reaching somewhere here at this position. You have put your microcatheter and plugged it with a plug of onyx here and then you are pushing. When you are pushing, since there is a plug of onyx here, there cannot be any more reflux. So whatever pressure that you are applying on the hub of the syringe is going to get transmitted directly into the distal territory. As long as you are in the periphery of the AVM, this is not a problem. But the more central you reach in the AVM, this is the time when if you don't pay attention and you keep on pushing, you can have an AVM rupture. So when you start seeing the glue cast or the onyx cast, and if it does not create a shape inside the AVM like any of these structures, you know that you have had a rupture. You may not have a bleed because the microcatheter is plugging that artery, but you have introduced some amount of onyx or whichever material you are trying to use in the subarachnoid space or in the intraparenchymal space. So you have to be very careful. That is when you stop injecting, wait for a moment or two, and then very slowly inject so that you seal off that rent and do not inject any more in that vessel. This is all just showing you the same things. I till now discussed about the catheterization techniques and I talked about the embolic material. We have another thing to our advantage that can be used during embolization. If you look at blood flow inside a blood vessel, the blood flow inside a blood vessel is laminar in the center, in the center of the vessel. But as you go towards the periphery, the flow becomes turbulent. This is for the reason that you do have some amount of friction between the column of blood and the endothelial lining. 
whereas the friction between the various layers of blood is not so much. So the central column of blood moves at a much faster pace and the peripheral column of blood moves at a much slower pace. So you can imagine that the entire vessel of blood is made up of multiple concentric cylinders, each cylinder on top of each other. How this helps us is, it is very important to understand that as you are in the center, so if you put your catheter right in the center of the vessel and you are coaxial along with the vessel, that means the long axis of your catheter is with the long axis of the vessel, then if you inject something, it will go ahead at a much faster velocity. So if you want to reach very distally, if you want to penetrate very deep into the AVM, this is the kind of position that you need to have. Whereas if you keep your catheter at the wall of this vessel, where the eddy currents are forming, where the turbulent flow is happening, so whatever embolic material you release from your catheter will move at a relatively slower pace when compared to, to the blood in the center and this will allow your material to start polymerizing right here at this point itself. So if you are in a very high flow situation in which your catheter has reached the point of the arteriovenous connection, then you have to make all attempts to keep your catheter towards the wall so that you utilize these eddy currents in polymerizing the liquid embolic that you are pushing so that it does not fly away. That is what we were trying to show. In the periphery, you have turbulent flow. In the center, you have laminar flow. So along with the catheterization techniques, along with the liquid embolic material, even the flow properties, the flow characteristics of the vessel will come to your help when you are trying to embolize an AVM. Uh, this we will skip. All my work is done exclusively with NBCA. I do not use Onyx, I do not use Squid, and uh, it is just because I am comfortable with it. So what you have to understand is, use the material with which you are comfortable, provided you can make it do what you want in a particular condition. For us, glue in different, in different uh, concentrations does different kinds of work in different cases. For example, we can have a fistula where we can have concentrated, we can have a plexiform where we can have dilute, we can have a mixture where we can have two or three different mixtures. So this is how we prepare our glue and this is what you need to, uh, you need to keep in mind uh, is uh, uh, we keep the volume of lipiodol initially constant. So for example, if you take one ml of lipiodol and you add 0.1 ml of NBCA to it, the kind of glue percentage you are going to get is 9%. And subsequently, as you reach 1 and 1, you are going to reach somewhere near 50%. Beyond 50%, we keep the amount of NBCA constant and we start reducing the concentration of glue, uh, of lipidol, so that we can get a glue concentration of approximately 91%. So depending on the kind of mixture that you have made, you will obviously have to choose it after the microcatheterization. You have done the microcatheterization with a particular catheter, you have done the microcatheter injection, you have seen the nidus, and then you are to decide. So whenever we are talking of, uh, uh, I think I missed something here. Uh, whenever we are talking about these so-called plexiform nidi, the glue concentration is going to be in the range of 17 to 29, 33%. Whenever we are talking about these mixed kind of nidi, the concentration is going to be in the range of 33 to 53, 56%. And whenever we are talking about these, plex, uh, these pure fistulous connections, the concentration of glue is going to be in the range of 60 to 90%. Please remember that as you go high on the concentration of glue, on the concentration of NBCA, the resultant amount of lipiodol in the entire mixture is going to be very less. So the opacity of this is going to be very less. This was true when we were talking about the image intensifier kind of cath labs. 
But in the flat panel machines that we have now, even 80 or 90 percent glue is usually pretty well visible. So what you should do is, if you are talking about concentrated glue, you're talking about 50, 60 percent glue going all the way to 90 percent. Once you prepare it in the syringe, you should please keep it in the fluoro field and you should see if it's visible. Because if it's not visible, then you have to change to plan B. If it's visible, you can go ahead and inject. Also remember that if you are injecting on a blank roadmap, uh, you will have better visibility. If you are injecting on a conventional roadmap, you might not have such good visibility. So that is also one more thing that you need to keep in mind. Uh, how we mix it is, I mean, this is not uh, very useful, but what we do is we take a stainless steel bowl and then we add the predetermined amounts of lipiodol and uh, histocryl. Uh, now we get something called endocryl. It is blue in color because histocryl for some reason is not available. So this used to be the previous one. This was the purple one. But now we get this as a blue one. And then we prepare this mixture and we keep it ready for injection. Uh, you also have to realize that this NBCA is going to come, is going to polymerize the moment it gets a positive ion on it. So you have to flush the entire system with uh, D5, 5% dextrose, which does not contain any ionic material. So you have to keep a particular bowl of 5% dextrose ready, and you have to flush the entire microcatheter along with the hub of the microcatheter. Also remember, when you push the syringe inside, you don't clear out the hub. So once you flush it in the hub, take the syringe out, put a dro few drops on the hub, and then again wash it. Because otherwise, if you have a very concentrated glue amount, it will start polymerizing there itself, and nothing will go up. So once this is done, then we start the injection. So in this entire discussion, uh, uh, moderators, please tell me when it's time for me to stop. Okay, so in this entire discussion, once you have catheterized, once you have reached in the vicinity of the AVM, this is a single picture which is going to be useful for you because it shows you everything about what kind of hardware you would like to use and what kind of position you would like to achieve. For example, this is a position in which the microcatheter has been placed uh, this is for all practical purposes. If I am not specifying, these are flow guided microcatheters. Uh, this is a double tipped microcatheter, so this is a coiling catheter. So these three situations, I am talking about any regular flow guided microcatheter. I most often use Marathon 1.5 for all my cases, and for cases in which um, the vessel is too small, even for a 1.5, I go ahead and use a Magic 1.2. So these are the only two flow-guided catheters that I use. Uh, as far as it comes to the double-tipped microcatheters, any catheter which you have, uh, any uh, coiling microcatheter, it can be a Headway 17, it can be a Headway Duo, Echelon, uh, anything, whatever you have, you can use. So if you have a flow-guided microcatheter in the center of the vessel, you can realize that this is a coaxial arrangement. And in this situation, if you were to inject something, it is going to go along the laminar flow in the center of the vessel. And this is very likely to go quite distal because you will have the flow around the catheter to carry all this material up to its distal end. So if you are not exactly in the AVM, you are maybe a couple of millimeters proximal to the AVM. In that case, you can use this situation. And in this situation, if you want to inject for a long time, your glue concentration should be in the range of around 25 to 30 percent. Because if you have anything more than that, it will start polymerizing at the beginning, and then your purpose will not be solved. This is the second variation, which can be done with a flow-guided microcatheter, or it can be done with even a double-tipped microcatheter. This is a situation in which you are eccentric, you are not wedged. That means, wedging essentially means that you have a catheter which has reached a vessel which is of equal diameter, equal to the OD of the catheter. That means once you wedge in, there is no blood flow going from behind. Then the only communication between the hub and the distality is what you are injecting through the catheter. So if you are not wedged, 
like this, that means there is still space around the catheter to carry the flow distally. So if you are eccentric and if you are not wedged, this basically means that you do not want to stop the flow, that is number one. And at the same time, you want to use the eddy currents in the periphery of the vessel to make your embolic major agent start solidifying somewhere here itself and not fly off distally into the circulation. So this kind of situation arises when we have the so-called fistulous connections in the AVM. So in fistulas, in high flow fistulas, if we can be eccentric and if we can be not wedged, then we use very high concentrated glue so that the mushroom shaped cast of glue starts forming right from here and then it occludes this vessel and then percolates distally and occludes a bit of the venous system. The third situation in, is in which you are coaxial and you are wedged completely. Now this can be done either with a double tipped catheter if your feeding artery is quite large or it can be done with a flow guided microcatheter if your flow is quite small. For example, this vessel has wedged, let us say, with a 2.7 French microcatheter. This is, let's say, a rebar, a rebar 27. But if this vessel were to be smaller, the same effect can be achieved even with a flow guided microcatheter. So you should know whether, a, if you want to wedge, whether you will need a 1.2, a 1.5, a 1.7, a 2.1, or a 2.7. Which French you will require, that will again depend on which kind of uh, flow characteristics you are using. The moment you are wedged, you have complete flow control. So we do this again in very high flow fistulous conditions in which because of this wedging, we occlude the flow so that we can deposit the material according to our liking. In other situations, we use this in AVMs also. For example, if you have an AVM which has got two or three feeding vessels and you have realized that out of the three, two vessels are very difficult to catheterize. So you have been able to get into one vessel, then you would like to be wedged and you would like to do a long injection of a diluted embolic material so that from the same pedicle, you get all the compartments. So depending on, this is a very dynamic situation. There are no fixed rules. Depending on the stage of embolization, depending on the distality of your catheter, depending on uh, what is the flow characteristics around the catheter, you would choose and then you would go ahead. The fourth situation is in which you are eccentric and you are wedged. This is again uh, for very distal locations and this is something that we don't advocate because you are almost in the AVM and for wedging sometimes we have to use a wire. So this is something that we don't use very often. Just a word of caution about uh, very dilute glues. I mentioned that we can have glue concentrations from 9% going all the way up to 95%. But anything less than 15%, let me show you what happens. This was an AVM. This was an AVM which was again very difficult to catheterize. This catheterization is of the posterior lateral choroidal artery. You can see that this catheter is wedged right into the AVM and now the glue is being injected. But this was a, this, this the, again the aim was to use this single pedicle and finish off the entire AVM. But anything less than 15% or anything less than 20% sometimes in high flow fistulas, what happens is the glue does not stick. So you can see it, it will come again. Uh, the glue was completely flying off. So whenever I recommend embolization, uh, at least for beginners, what I would say is use anything which is more than around 20, 25%, especially in high flow fistulas. Because in uh, high flow fistulas, very dilute glue cannot be controlled. Okay, so now just uh, let us see some cases and I think we'll wind up with that. An AVM, this is an AVM which was supplied by the callosomarginal artery and the pericallosal artery predominantly. The moment you see an AVM and the moment you see that the feeding arteries are having two different diameters, this may mean one of two things. It may mean that the smaller diameter artery has been recruited later 
or this may also mean that the larger diameter artery is harboring predominantly fistulous connections in its territory. So the moment you see this, even on a CT or even in an MR angio, you start thinking that you are going to be confronted with a situation in which you are going to have multiple different levels of uh, difficulty inside the AVM nidus. The same thing is seen here in the axial section. And this is what we thought this AVM is going to show to us. It is going to show us a fistulous connection from the lower artery, and it is going to show us a plexiform condition from this callosomarginal artery. So we went ahead and catheterized this. When we catheterized this, uh, this AVM had three distinct compartments. This AVM had a lateral compartment, this AVM had a medial compartment, and this AVM had a superior compartment. What we realized is the lateral and the superior compartments were actually the same because the same feeding artery was supplying this angioarchitecture as well as this angioarchitecture. So what is basically happening is the feeding artery, the moment it enters the nidus, is dividing into two parts. One part is going inferiorly. This part is the one which is supplying the plexiform part. And then when you pull this microcatheter back and then you renegotiate it into this compartment, like this, it is supplying the fistulous part. So when you start embolizing this AVM, or even for that matter through this particular RTL compartment, you have to realize that you will require a different strategy for the plexiform part and a different strategy from the, for the fistulous part. Then you come to the inferior compartment of the AVM. This was a small compartment. This was again plexiform. So plexiform, plexiform, fistulous. So what did we do? We first went through the superior most important branch and then we went into this plexiform part. And through the plexiform part, you can see there, we filled up all these. You can see that that is all this glue is going into the plexiform part now. And then you have the fistless compartment, which is left at the top. So please look at the shape of the glue, the way in which it is traveling. It is traveling as multiple linear streaks, multiple thin lines. So this is the point when it is, it is filling up the entire plexiform part. Then once the plexiform part was done, this glue had nowhere to go from the same pedicle but in the fistula. So now you can see that this is the fistula being filled up predominantly. And then once the fistula and the plexiform parts from the main feeder are done, then you come to the supplementary feeder from below and then you finish off the rest of this AVM. So the behavior of the embolic material again you saw was quite different for the simple reason that here we used a 25%, here we used a 30%, and here we used a 70% glue. You can also see that here it filled predominantly the plexiform parts, but here we developed a nice large cast inside the AVM. And at the end of embolization, this is where we started, this is where we stopped. Now, this area that is seen here is looking very suspicious like a part of the AVM. It might be, but at this point, it was not shunting anymore. So you have to stop here, and if it is any part of perinatal gen genesis, because this was uh, right on the, on, the, on the inferior parietal lobule, so that is an area which we did not want to mess around with too much. So on follow-up, we found that this area had also involuted, and this patient remains for follow-up for around five or six years now, and this AVM has not grown back. Most important in terms of hardware uh, when you talk about AVMs uh, is to look at the cast of the embolic material that you have deposited inside the AVM and you should be able to pick out each part of the AVM in the cast. It acts like a surrogate. So the entire plexiform part on the medial side, the entire plexiform part on the lateral side and the fistulous portion on the lateral side all are seen in the glue cast. Just another case, multi-compartmental AVM, a relatively large-sized AVM. The problem was this was, this was sitting almost uh, uh, very close to the calcarine area. There was supply from the medial side also, so we had to be very, very careful. There was some supply from the PC as well. Most of the components of this AVM uh, were 
plexiform. Now the rule which I told you about looking at the different size of feeding arteries does not hold true in this case. Here we thought that we might find some fistulae uh, because this was a large branch, but obviously this branch was the primary branch which had been feeding the AVM for quite some time. That's why it was quite large. We go inside the AVM, we go inside each of these compartments, we break down each of these compartments. That is the distalmost compartment, that is the intermediate compartment, that is the proximal compartment, that is the superior compartment, that's the inferior compartment. So we break down the entire AVM. First, we catheterize all the compartments of the AVM. We don't start embolizing just because we have entered into a vessel. We study the AVM first, we look at the flow characteristics, because this is going to save a lot of pain later on. If you start embolizing from the first vessel that you have entered without understanding the rest of the AVM, it's going to be a disaster. So we look at all the compartments. We realize that all these compartments were plexiform compartments. So working in plexiform compartments, working with around 25 to 30% glue. Uh, this was the live injection of the proximal most compartment. Now the question is, whenever we have an AVM, where do we start the embolization from? For example, this AVM has five compartments. So which compartment of this AVM is the first to be embolized? The compartment which has the highest risk for a bleed. For example, if there is a compartment which is harboring an aneurysm, you deal that first. For example, there is a compartment which is sitting right next to the ventricular wall, right next to the ependymal wall, like this compartment is sitting right next to the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. And this is where he had bled. So this is the area which is not splinted by any brain matter from one side. So this area needs to be treated first. So we went into this area, plexiform compartment, long glue injection. You can see that a single glue injection will obliterate almost 30 to 40% of this AVM. Now we are entering a bit into the vein. We have gone a couple of drops, but not into the main draining vein. We are filling up all these areas, all these areas. And then you have the main collector vein for this compartment being occluded. So similarly, Compartment by compartment, we go, and uh, compartment by compartment, we occlude. This was the second compartment that was embolized. Uh, we can again see the glue being injected. Again, through the same pedicle, we are going through this artery, the artery of the angular gyrus, and we are injecting glue in this particular compartment now. Once the glue is injected in this compartment, then we have the posterior and the superior compartments remaining. So at the end of all these injections, this is the kind of uh, glue injection that was done in this particular AVM. The entire AVM nidus was taken out and the draining vein along with a supplementary venous drainage which was going up to the superior sagittal sinus was also taken out. And this is what we are left with. All the RTL pedicles are completely intact and the AVM is completely gone. This is in the arterial phase, exclusion, and this is in the venous phase, exclusion of the AVM nidus. Just one more case probably. Yeah, here this is a PL fistula in a young child, in a one-year-old child. And uh, here uh, we realized that we went with a double tip microcatheter because the idea was to wedge in the vessel as much as possible. But this vessel was huge. So what you can see basically is, the moment we are injecting some dye, the entire dye is getting washed off immediately. So in these situations, there are many techniques that can be used. Uh, you can reduce the blood pressure, so we bring down the BP to around 40 mean. Uh, that is maybe around 60 by 30 in that range. Uh, we also sometimes use uh, hypothermia, uh, and we sometimes use uh, uh, adenosine-induced cardiac arrest. But in this case, what we did is, uh, to reduce the flow, this is a technique which cardiologists use to reduce the flow uh, when they are doing a balloon valvuloplasty, let's say, of the, of the aortic valve or of the pulmonary valve. What they do is, they pace the heart at very high rates. So this is with the pacing off and this is with the pacing on you can automatically see that there is almost a two to three second delay in the clearing off of contrast material. 
So this amount of slowing, even a 25 to 30 percent slowing with the pacing, we pace at around 220 to 240 beats per minute. At that time, the ventricular contraction is not like this. It is like this. It is almost like a fibrillation. So that time, the stroke volume is hampered. When the stroke volume is less, the column of blood does not move much. When the column of blood does not move much, we get some additional time. So this case was embolized with pacing. And uh, what we were able to achieve is, uh, this is the injection, again, with pacing on. And that is the glue injection. You can see this is a rebar 27. It's a huge microcatheter. And when we inject the glue, the first couple of drops of glue just flew off. But now, we reduce the flow, we slowed the injection, and then you can see that the entire area a glue cast is being developed. See that again. The first couple of drops of glue will just fly off. So that is the time when you have to slightly reduce the injection. You, can, you saw that? There was, there was a tiny black dot which just went off. That is when you have to be on your feet. You have to just reduce it slightly. And then when you keep on pushing, this is what you're going to get. And at the end of it, this is what we were left with. Uh, we were able to exclude the fistula completely from the circulation. In fact, uh, for uh, the seasoned clinicians here, you can see that this child had a large amount of hydrocephalus also because of this PL fistula. All these things, this is basically because of a hydrovenous disorder. All these things settle down in the coming few months. So I think I'll just, uh, my, my time is up. I'll just stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, I have a lot of other cases to show. But if you have other questions, I would like to use the cases to clear your doubts. So I think uh, this is where I'll stop. Once again, it's, it's magical, sir. Not the hardware. <laughs> Not the magic hardware. But, sir, uh, just wanted to know because you were saying that, uh, you know, you, you do so much of planning in your procedure before you inject the glue. And many a times we, we do an angiogram once, you know, see the case, then counsel, and then. So, what is your usual plan, sir? And if at all you are taking hardware just for angiogram, uh, what are your hardwares going to be? Meaning, do you do both the sessions at the same time? Yeah, 90% uh, of the information that is required for planning for an AVM is available on a well done MR. You have an MR with the adequate sequences, you, we use a T1 inversion recovery sequence. Uh, you can get most of this information. The angio architecture of a particular AVM depends on its location in the brain topography. The angio architecture is very, very predictable. For example, if you have an AVM in the telencephalon or in the neopallium, that is where 70% of AVMs occur, the blood supply can be predicted to a degree which is higher than what you can predict on a routine 2D DSA. Because sometimes you do not see all the vessels on a DSA because of the force with which you inject. If you increase the force, if you bring down the patient's pressure, you will see more and more vessels. But whether the AVM is going to have a deep supply or not, whether the AVM is going to have a deep venous drainage or not, all these things are predicted completely and thoroughly on an MR. Tesla MRI, sir. MRI, regular uh, MRI. Regular, 1.5 TSA. 1.5 We work with 1.5 T. So 1.5 T MR with the required sequences. We have a AVM protocol, which we have been following since I was with Professor Valvanis. We use the same protocol. The routine studies that you see by diagnostic centers, that is not enough. But we need, for example, we need a T1 MP rage. We need a volumetric sequence uh, of the entire brain so that we can cut the brain into sagittal and coronal sections. So one volumetric T1 sequence, one coronal T1 inversion recovery sequence, then your normal flare and MR angio. Not even a contrast MR angio. A top MR angio is more than enough. So with this, we predict what the blood supply is going to be, what the RTL supply is going to be, what the venous drainage is going to be. And uh, it is 100% it is accurate. 
In fact, sometimes you don't see the vessels that you expect to see on the DSA. But as the embolization progresses and as the hemodynamics of the AVM nidus changes, you start seeing those vessels. We, do, we don't do diagnostic angiograms for AVMs. It is all done in the same sitting. All the planning is done on MR. And uh, uh, our hardware choice is very simple. We use a five French diagnostic H1 catheter as guide. The reason for that is, for flow-guided microcatheters, you need flow. The larger the catheter in the carotid, the lesser is going to be the flow in the distal territory. So if you use a large bore six French or a seven French catheter in the carotid, you have occluded almost 60 to 70% of that carotid. So the amount of flow that you need to capitalize on the flow-guided properties of a microcatheter is gone completely. For a flow-guided microcatheter, you need to stay proximal. I will say in the mid-cervical ICA. So that you allow the flow to carry the catheter to where it wants to go. It is extremely counterintuitive to have a flow-guided microcatheter inside a distal axis catheter. Because your distal axis catheter is in the M1, and then you have a two centimeter part of the 15 centimeter flow-guided part which has been so carefully engineered by these people, which is hanging out of the catheter. So you don't have any flow hitting the catheter that is going to take it up. So with a flow-guided catheter, stay proximal. But if you were to use a double-tipped microcatheter, coiling. coiling microcatheter, then you have to go distal. Because when you are using a coiling microcatheter, you are basically pushing it over the wire. So you need to have that support. But here, you want the flow to take it. I have just put this case. This was uh, another case. This was a huge dural fistula. And this fistula had no accessible vessels except this one very, very, very tortuous superficial temporal artery. And this superficial temporal artery was going through a burr hole, which had been made by someone through st for some reason. And this was supplying the dural fistula of the dorsal epidural space. So we were able to take these eight to 10 curves and then that is where we stopped. So in this case also, we are not wedged, but we have used the principles that we discussed to start injecting from here and then slowly push a column of glue from the extracranial artery into the intracranial artery. Now in this case also, in the entire field, you do not see the so-called guide catheter, which is the diagnostic catheter. Which is, in the internal mag which is in the proximal part of the external carotid artery. If you were to put this artery slightly higher up into the superficial temporal, thinking that you will go more distal, then obviously this microcatheter would not have taken all these bends. So remember, whenever you are working with a flow-guided microcatheter, let there be flow. Don't use large bore catheters in the neck. Let there be good blood pressure. 120, 130 systolic, so that it helps you. Use a good amount of vasodilatation. Use the regular nimodipine in the drip. Sometimes we use milanone in the drip. Sometimes we use nimodipine through the microcatheter. So you can do all those kinds of things. But when you're using a coiling microcatheter, you have to have an intermediate catheter, and with that, you have to go ahead. Coiling microcatheters, we use very less in, uh, in uh, regular AVMs. But whenever you have PL fistulae, the planning is such that we will have to use it. So the base camp will be according to the use of a coiling microcatheter. Uh, as far as other hardware is concerned, I don't use anything else, only this much. One more important thing in terms of hardware is whichever hardware you use, keep on using the same so that one fine day you'll master it. And to the Medtronic guys, where's Balbir? He's not there. Ah, yeah. uh, Balbir is there. I'm telling them, I've heard that they are going to pull out Marathon. So please, please, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Because among the lot, as of today, Marathon is the best flow-guided microcatheter in 1.5. If you were to bring 1.2, I think Magic will be out of market. Because the only places where we use, because Marathon works very well with Traxxas. Uh, 1.5 uh, Magic does not work with Traxxas. 
and you don't use a detachable microcatheter any time not not uh, very often very very less because uh, the philosophy of my embolization is to leave nothing in the parent vessel so how can i justify a detachable tip microcatheter okay. because you have a 1.5 cm detachable tip so only maybe around 3 mm will be inside the avm correct rest of them will be in the parent vessel so i don't use it but uh, if the need be we can definitely use it in transvenous i use it yes So, what do you think that uh, we see when, whenever the onyx uh, embolization, they uh, uh, penetrate uh, better uh, compartment. So, do yeah. you find there is difference between uh, glue and onyx in? Obviously, onyx? because you have more time for injection, yeah. and one compartment gets filled over, it will go to the next, it will go to the next, it will go to the next, it will reflux also. So, that is also a very good way of doing things. But since I have not used onyx, so I will not be commenting on that. Then we do the same in fact we can do the same with uh, glue also um, i would have maybe i'll later i'll show you some examples in which glue has penetrated three compartments but that is the rarity it does not happen every time i think sure that it's a multi compartmental with the compartmental connections uh, or priority was starting to i i'll answer i'll answer that question you are never sure you are never in, sure in neuro intervention you are never sure and the moment you start uh, thinking that you are sure that is when problems happen in fact most of this uh, analysis in the f initial few cases came in retrospect when we were embolizing we did not realize what we were doing but we finished the case and then you have a cold uh, glass of juice and you are sitting with the images then suddenly things fall into place so in the first couple of years i think it will be fair to say that uh, you don't really understand what is happening but as the years progress and you keep on looking at them uh, now all this planning happens on autopilot we don't we don't even sit with the machine we just see the mr uh, we don't see axial sections we will look at coronal and sagittal for planning and then the planning is done in the mind but initially it used to take 4 to 6 hours so at what glue concentration do you think that uh, microcatheter gets obstructed uh, it gets uh, it depends that dip, that can happen even with 20% depending on your injection so or if you have not cleared out the blood if you have not cleared out the the ionic material so if we, we have multiple compartments then and microcatheter gets occluded so no so each each microcatheter has to be with a each, each compartment is with a separate microcatheter okay. so each avm a large avm will take around 5 6 7 microcatheters Hello, sir. Uh, sir, uh, have you used uh, dextrose push technique during the glue embolization? Of yes. The in and fact, if at all, in which condition you decide whether to push dextrose? Or in fact, uh, that is the exact case for you. Uh, let me go back and show you again. Yeah, uh, the injection is on the right side. The injection is there. If you can see. See, there is something moving right here. You can see something moving here in the front, and something moving here behind. What is moving in the front was much more concentrated because it is less opaque when compared to this, which is flowing from behind. See again. It will come again. Yeah. see you can already see something flowing here so this in this situation we use a three way in which we had one syringe of concentrated glue 80 90% because we first wanted to create a plug and then the second had dextrose to push this away distally and by the time i was pushing this this was removed and a dilute glue was pushed from behind so we do all this all these things we do but uh, uh, these are things that i will uh, i will not say that you do it because it's glue if it gets stuck this is an extracranial artery so not much of a problem even in an intracranial artery if your catheter gets stuck not much of a problem if it's a large artery you can just cut it at the groin but that is something that i don't recommend because the chances while you are changing while you are pushing with dextrose you are doing multiple maneuvers here 
it can polymerize there. And glue polymerization, in fact, I skipped those slides. Glue polymerization has got three phases, the hyperacute, the acute, and the chronic. The hyperacute phase is within seconds, within five to 10 seconds, in which most of the glue cast is ready. The acute stage is in the next five to 10 minutes. And there is a chronic stage also. For example, this is a situation in which this is an initial cast of glue. In the initial cast of glue, you can see these multiple holes. These multiple holes will get filled up in the chronic phase. But the problem is the acute phase is very short, five to 10 seconds. So in these five to 10 seconds, if your syringe does not get connected to the lower lock, if your technician drops a syringe, then that's it, you're done. But if you are comfortable and if you're confident, that's what I have shown you, it can be done. Thank you, sir. I'm forgetting the duties as a moderator and probably as a student, I'm just, <laughs> so, so. Uh, just, just a moment. Uh, please, please, please join us at the Patna course next, next month, 7th and 8th of July, where you will see this and much more. Uh, we are concentrating on the spinal cord this time. So spinal cord anatomy is something which is not taught in many places. So we are dedicating one full day to spinal cord. So please join us. Just one second, sir. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Govindo Pramanik to please uh, felicitate our uh, beloved speaker, beloved with capital letters. <laughs>